Um, but I just wanted to say thank you all for being here today. We see lots of new faces um, and some faces that have been around for a bit, and we're excited to kind of bring you all together to talk about the Oasis Consortium, get us all on the same page and, and talk about where we can go moving forward with, um, like I said, the, the new help and those that have been with us for a little while. Um, once again, if you're just joining, this meeting is recorded so that it can be shared with um, anyone who's not here today, and I'll distribute it to you all as well so you have it for your records. Just a few ground rules. Um, if you are able to speak and, and going to speak at some point, we ask that your camera is turned on. Um, I thank you all that have your cameras on now. It's nice to see your faces instead of little boxes, um, but we understand if, if you need to have it turned off, that's okay too. Um, please keep your mic muted. Um, you're welcome to use the chat function to um, ask questions as we go through. You're also welcome to unmute as appropriate. Um, this is definitely going to be a, an opportunity today to ask questions and to get all the information that you all need. So please feel free at any point to ask questions as we go through. There may be some opportunities to come to consensus. We ask that, you know, we have respectful discussions and that, you know, whatever we come to as consensus is something that we can all live with moving forward. Please respect the speaker. And then um, this is a HESI staff uh, original here with the Elmo, which is, you know, if, if we come to a conversation and we need to move on, then we just say Elmo and we just move on with our conversation. And if you have any meeting issues, please um, send an email to Connie. She'll be monitoring it so she can um, get us rolling here. So again, thank you all for being here. This is our first kind of kickoff general members meeting. And the goal for today is really to get us all on the same page and provide this overview of the consortium. We're gonna walk through some study goals, anticipated outcomes and work stream progress. And we'll talk through some asks that we have and opportunities to get more involved with the consortium. And so I'll go through some introductions and, um, and then we'll have uh, a few of our fearless leaders kind of take us through some of the big questions, resourcing, um, the study overview, and then all of our work stream updates. And so introductions, um, I am talking and I'm Chrissy Crute. I should have introduced myself first. Um, if you've probably received some emails from me at this point, but I am a scientific program manager at HESI. Um, you'll also see Connie Mitchell on your screen. She is a senior scientific program manager at HESI and we're co-leading this project. Um, our executive director, Cyril, I believe is on, or if she's not, she will be on shortly. And also we see Lisa Koski there. Um, she is also a scientific program manager at HESI and leads our communications team. So there's a good chance you'll get emails from one of the four of us at some point. And so just to give a little bit of background for those of you who may be new to HESI, we are a nonprofit organization that serves as a convener of academic, NGOs, industry, and government sectors to advance um, human and environmental health and safety. And we work through kind of these four scientific focus areas. And within that, we have 17 scientific committees. And OASIS is housed within this bolded committee called ESTAR, which is our Emerging Systems Toxicology for the Assessment of Risk. And HESI helps solve kind of these pressing risk and safety challenges by creating a knowledge base through a variety of mechanisms, including things like frameworks, manuscripts, tools and assays development, scientific meetings and trainings. And OASIS is a really good example of, you know, this mechanism that will have plenty of outcomes that we'll kind of discuss as we go through to advance the field. And I wanted to make sure that I could introduce our steering team today. Again, you'll be hearing from some of them. So Anne, Dr. Ann Carpenter and Dr. David Rocchier are our co-chairs of OASIS. Yeah, if you want to give a little wave to let everyone know who you are. Um, and Anne is, serves as our public sector lead and David serves as our ag chem sector co-lead. Dr. Josh Harrell from EPA leads our study design work group, and he's also a public sector lead. Dr. Jess LaRocca serves as our compound selection lead, and she's also an ag chem sector co-lead. Dr. Andreas Bender, it will be leading our data analysis work stream. Uh, Dr. Shantanu Singh is both involved with um, the data extraction work group lead, but he's also the lead PI on the MLSC award, which we'll um, give you some details on as well. 
Dr. Aaron Fullerton is our pharma sector co-lead along with Saba Kadri, who's our other pharma sector co-lead. So um, you'll see their faces, but just wanted to give them the official introduction and say, you know, thank you all for your hard work so far. And so just to get an idea of who's all in the room today, um, the OASIS Consortium has currently um, um, at least eight academic, two nonprofit, five government, and 13 industry members. We also have five confirmed um, tech partners who wrote letters of support for the consortium. Um, but I want to note that as we talk through things today, we have other tech tech partners who we've been talking to who've either offered verbal commitments or have had conversations. So um, this is just kind of the, the base layer here, but we also have some more partners who are um, about to join or who have been in talks about joining. And we thank you all for being here. And so I just wanted to give kind of a general overview of what each of these um, tiers of partnership means at an OASIS. And so some of you here today are potential partners, and, and that's those of you who have not yet committed to OASIS, but that Connie and I have been talking with and sharing materials. And um, as a potential partner, you will receive invitations to public meetings such as these. If you kind of move into the tech partner area, this is an agreement to provide in-kind donations and expertise to OASIS. You will receive invitations to meetings such as these, along with workstream meetings that are relevant to your contribution. And um, to be a tech partner, you will agree to abide by the consortium's guiding principles um, and would sign any sort of like in-kind donation contracts as necessary. And finally, for our kind of our member tier, these are, um, those of you that have provided expertise, um, potentially in-kind support, and industry members are providing resourcing support, which is $150,000 over three years. And these members receive open access to all of our meetings, all of our minutes, um, along with our SharePoint login, so you can view all the materials. And our industry members agree to abide by the consortium's guiding or by our consortium legal agreement and all other members agree to abide by the guiding principles. So that's kind of who we all have in the room today. And I'm going to pass over the microphone to David, who's gonna walk us through some of the, the big questions for the OASIS consortium. Thank you, thank you, Chrissy. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so maybe a few words concerning a uh, short introduction, introduction from my side. I'm David Rouquier working for Bayer uh, Crop Science Division. I'm based in, as you might hear from my accent, uh, so in France, um, in south of France, in Sofia Antipolis. So yeah, just to, to, to tell you about the, um, the big question we are trying to answer um in this uh in this consortium um apply to the safety assessment of small molecules both from the agrochemical sector and also from the pharmaceutical sector as well so two big driving forces similar but not identical between the two sectors in the agrochemical sector we are facing in this new push from uh, both the society and the regulatory uh, bodies to try to reduce um, the use of uh, lab animal uh, testing for uh, safety assessment of our products. We have some uh, tentative deadlines uh, to achieve that um, was published by US EPA back in 2019 or so, um, where the, the target date would be 2035. So a lot of um, in Europe also we had uh, some uh, even shorter deadlines uh, in terms of implementation so we there is a strong need to uh, better understand and get the trust in the in vitro safety assessment of our of our product for um, to, to determine the safe dose of use of our product in the future and one of the big question about um, this oasis project is to understand and um, find the boundaries or about what what can uh, in vitro test method can uh, can provide an information um, with regard to safety and what is uh, currently not possible in in some sense on the other side we have the pharmaceutical um, uh, driving force more there dealing with the the, the translation between um, 
to improve the translations of the preclinical and the clinical phases so to to uh, to improve the, this aspect um, uh, there is also this push also about the reduction of animals with the the, the famous 3r principles um, but I would say not as uh, acute as it could it could be for the for, for us in a, in the agrochemical sector so um, so in the next slide Chrissy um, there is a, a very uh, um, generic um, outline about what will be the, the, the how we're going to try to answer all those questions uh, both from the agrochemical and the pharmaceutical sector starting maybe on the top of the slide with in vitro uh, evaluation of some products and some chemicals that has been already um, evaluated into the uh, lab animal um, uh, in the rat in particular in, in 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 28 day study in particular so that will be the first exploration that's going to be done both uh, from rat cell culture and rat in vivo data make an evaluation of the in, in vitro to in vivo translation, um, doing uh, dose response uh, evaluation, determining the, the so-called point of departure of the effects uh, with different technologies, so cell painting, of course, um, but also transcriptomics and proteomics. And then through the estimates of the, some estimate of exposure of this, uh, of this compound, try to, to benchmark the, the result in vitro and in vivo. Uh, in in the in the context of rat uh, physiology, let's say, um, and basically we're going to do exactly the same uh, when it comes to the human situation. Since we are focusing on the liver uh, in the in the in the Oasis project, we have the the possibility to anchor uh, some of the effects in the human uh, thanks to the some information uh, concerning the drug induced liver injury. Um, that has been recorded and available in the public domain. So the same type of a, same type of uh, comparison and translation are going to be evaluated in that case using human cell cultures of different kinds that will be cell lines, that will be um, organoids potentially, that will be organ on the chip, and then benchmark the, the, these two things together. And one last translation that could be also of interest um, would be the, to, to understand better the, the link between in vivo rat data for the compound which have been already tested both in the, in the um, in the rats and for which we have also this this daily information so in a nutshell that's all the the learnings we try to to generate to um, to answer all those uh, big questions both for again from agrochemical sector and and pharma on the next slide Chrissy, yeah the, in terms of anticipated outcomes from this exercise and this uh, project um, obviously there, there will be a novel data set um, on rat and human cell culture that will that uh, and that will be generated to inform about um, the, 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 the the talks and uh, and the practices around the, the cell painting um, there will be some information um, Generating in terms of molecular data, molecular data for hepatotoxicity screening, but also um, on safety assessment of chemical, globally speaking. Um, new multi-platform multi informatic methods for the predictive method uh, toxicology. Um, we are building there a big expert network of toxicology, uh, cell biology, omics, and informa informatics, so very multidisciplinary network. And this, uh, even more interesting, I, I think also it's across sectors. And the outcomes, some of the outcomes, of course, we, we want to make publications, build this, and give access to a, a, a databases. Um, and uh, and platform for pool resources out of all the, the work that was going to be done into the Oasis project. And with this, I think um, I know still the, the in term of uh, novelty. So yeah, some might say and and <laughs> we heard that already that yeah again another project on on liver. Uh, in talks, it's true that um, why why dealing with liver, why uh, dealing with um, with um, 
uh, technologies or mixed technologies because there, there are plenty of or already ongoing projects uh, or past projects which have been uh, addressing this type of um, um, this type of issues. So the lever is again it's a, it's a use case. It's it's a, it's a target tissue that could be of interest both for the two sectors, agrochemical and um, and uh, pharmaceutical sector. Of course, the big novelties is about the use of uh, and the emerging new use of cell painting in, in toxicology. Uh, and it's also about these things about um, uh, combining uh, in a system biology approach all those different measurements uh, to inform about the safety assessment of our product. Um, the compounds, uh, there, there will be compounds that industry will contribute it both from the agrochemical sector and, and pharmaceutical sector. Um, and those compounds are compounds which obviously are have been already characterized in vivo. Um, we don't want obviously not to, to generate any other uh, in vivo studies in, uh, in, in this program. We make use of historical uh, information. And um, the fact of choosing the liver is also the this opportunity to get information in human uh, through the, some clinical data that has been generated uh, in uh, with some of the drugs and we know what are the effects in, in human even if the, the level of information retrieved from this clinical information is not as deep as what you can find in uh, in vivo tox data in the rats still it's uh, super valuable um, information um, and, uh, and and i said that going to be uh, super useful um, at the end of this project, all the data and the method will be uh, publicly shared. And again, as, as I said earlier, um, the nature of this multidisciplinary and multi-sector uh, team uh, of scientists, and I would say uh, from industry, from academia, and from the regular body bodies make, make this uh, initiative uh, super exciting. And I think where we're gonna learn a lot. Thank you for that, David. All right, we'll turn ourselves over here. We'll let Anne take us through some resourcing for OASIS. Hi everyone, I'm Anne Carpenter from the Broad Institute and I was leading the JUMP Consortium, which um, got a lot of uh, the sub, some subset of you organized um, for, for um, a different data generation grant about three years ago and that was really a success. And we decided to go back to the same um, public funding source to apply for the OASIS grant. And thankfully it was awarded. It's not um, public that yet that it's been awarded to our group. I guess they, they'll make a big announcement shortly. Um, but this was um, a bit over a million dollars from the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. And the PI of that is the co-lead of, of my lab, Shantanu Singh. He's the computationalist and, and I'm the cell biologist in the group. And um, it will support um, data creation. And the data creation has to happen in Massachusetts and um, it has to be focused entirely on data creation. And the way this grant is set up is it um, is uh, you can only apply for it if you have a an industry partner who is willing to chip in on the analysis side. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see how we accomplish that. Um, what we decided to do is have industry partners sign up to contribute um, $50,000 a year for three years, so a rather small-ish commitment for, for a large consortium effort like this. And that money goes into a big pool that in part pays for the data analysis uh, postdoc who is hired at the Broad. Um, so thankfully we, we knew this grant was coming and we've been talking to several really talented um, researchers in the field and have recruited the, the data scientist postdoc and we'll talk about that in a moment. So the partners are listed here and it, it covers the agrochemical and pharmaceutical industries. We're also open to, to chemical companies as well. Next. So um, we are also, um, you know, I love this, this, the way that these grants really spur, they really do their job. They really spur collaboration that wouldn't have happened otherwise and ideas for projects that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And in addition to bringing the pharma and agrochemical companies together, it also allows us to um, have different 
uh, companies pitch in who produce different technologies that could be useful to us. And so um, we included some listed here that were involved in the original grant proposal where they committed to providing a certain amount of um, either of in-kind um, effort slash uh, materials slash reagents. And um, those are listed here. We're really grateful that um, we have a lot of really neat cutting edge technologies that we can put to the test in this um, project. It's been um, also useful from their point of view uh, to have a, a third party um, nonprofit organization um, carrying out this analysis and designing it in a really nice way and doing it at a scale that just wouldn't really be feasible within each individual um, technology producer. Um, I think that's a really great advantage to these companies as well. And, and we have many other um, folks who are interested in being involved and we'll have a, a, a stage, we won't be able to um, gather up enough compounds to send to absolutely every um, potential um, liver tissue kind of platform or um, or every kind of omics um, that might be measured. So the part of the job of the consortium, part of the work streams of experimental design, will be to figure out which of these are practical and reasonable that we can um, that we can partner with downstream and and um, and gather data from. Next slide. Um, together, that pool of money that's coming from the AgChem and Pharma partners, the um, 50K a year, goes to pay partly for more experimental work beyond the, the million dollar grant. We'll, we'll need a bit more money for, for different kinds of omics. Um, and then as mentioned, it pays for a full-time postdoc at the Broad. We're going to split that position between two um, really, really talented and amazing researchers that I'm so happy have decided to join our lab. That's Srijit Seal, who just joined um, a few weeks ago and Jessica Ewald who's coming in January and some many of you may have seen them at um, Society of Toxicology meetings and, and be aware of their research but we're really excited that, that they've joined um, because they have the quite the background for for doing this sort of work and they're of course excited because no one's had access to this scale of data before um, in the field of, of toxicology then we also have a PhD student in biostatistics that's Miriam Gregorian and um, who's going to be co-supervised um, between Dr. David Rook at, at um, Bayer and um, Vincent Van de Waal um, at the Cote d'Azur. Um, so really excited to have um, so much um, so much energy put on the analysis side. As we all know, it's one thing to make data, it's quite another to, to analyze it and, um, and design and analyze it in a way that's going to allow us to draw the conclusions that we're looking forward to. Um, and then a little bit of the money also used towards um, storage and open access publications, but uh, fundamentally um, having all these different groups involved, it's not about providing the money and the resources entirely, it's also about providing the input to make sure that what we, um, what the group designs is something that's really going to come to conclusions that you all need to progress this field forward. That's it for resources. Thank you, Anne. All right, so this next part of our presentation, um, I'll just quickly overview the OASIS study design, um, and then we'll get into kind of each of our individual work streams and where, you know, the process is right now and where we're headed. A few of you I'm sure have seen these slides before, but just to bring us kind of all back to the main mission of this project, which is to gain confidence in the combination of cell painting, transcriptomics, and proteomics for safety assessment, as we've mentioned, using hepatotoxicity as a use case. And again, the reason for this is there's just so much of that in vivo hepatotoxicity data out there, um, whether that's from rodent or clinical trials. Um, and so we're able to take these new compounds and um, benchmark that information with these new omics data that we'll generate. And so this is our overview of study design. And right now we're looking at about 1,800 total compounds, um, about 1,600 of those we've looked through the public domain and we'll go through kind of how that's come about um, and 200 of those we're estimating will come donated from industry partners and within that we'll generate cell exposures and U2OS cells which um, are a very common cell line used for cell painting and then we'll move through the HEPA RGs which is our um, human cell immortalized cell line and then through rat primary hepatocytes. And then that's kind of what we're calling our first phase. And then hopefully we will get to our second phase, which will be to use these organoids and liver on a chip to, um, to generate data as well. And through all of those lines, we'll be um, using cell painting, transcriptomics, and proteomics to generate um, our database. 
and then we'll move through our comprehensive data analysis, which um, is in planning right now. And as we've mentioned, this will lead us to publicly accessible database and published methodologies along with the community of practice. And so to, to get to those aims there, um, we have two work streams that I've been working um, since the inception, I think, of OASIS. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Jess LaRocca to talk about our compound selection and data extraction work stream. Great. Thanks, Chrissy. Can everybody hear me okay? Sounds good. Great. All right. Um, so this worksheet, uh, our goal is to um, identify compounds that will be useful for us for, again, predicting um, liver tox, um, leveraging data both from in vivo rat um, as well as human data. Um, so um, First, I would just really want to say a lot of the progress that we've made so far is really due to the incredible efforts um, from uh, Srijit. So just want to thank him very much for all of that. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a, we have a compilation of, of compounds so far that have, uh, are from publicly available databases. So um, this includes like uh, TG gates, uh, drug matrix, and then uh, for the human data is um, the DILIST. Um, so, um, as far as those public and private compounds that's listed here, so where we're at so far is we have around a thousand compounds with the human data only. Um, so that's uh, coming pretty much exclusively from DILIST. Uh, we have about 400 compounds with RAT and VIVO data from publicly available databases, uh, including ToxRFDB, TG Gates, and Drug Matrix. And we also have the private database ETOX with another 200 compounds. Um, and then we're anticipating approximately 200 compounds that are going to be donated from industry partners. So this is going to include both um, pharmaceutical compounds as well as agrochemicals. And really what we want at the end of the day is a nice um, blend, I would say, of representation of compounds from uh, the different sectors. So really focusing both on, on ag chem and pharmaceuticals. So we don't want it too heavily based in one versus the other. Um, so what we're going to do is the next step is really look at what we have so far, um, understand that we do have a good capture across the different um, sectors. Um, and if we feel like we have a, a weak point, then we can discuss how we're going to fill in that gap. Um, the other uh, component that we'll need to take a look at is the type of in vivo rat data that we have, because not all of these databases have um, equal, <laughs> I would say, in vivo data um, available. So that's something we're also going to need to do as a next step. Uh, could we go to slide 26? Okay. Um, so what are what data are we going to be generating on these compounds? Um, so for, um, we're going to do the full compound set for cell painting in the U2OS cell line, as well as the um, liver HEPA-RG um, cell line, because what we are, the HEPA-RG is um, really chosen because um, it's amenable with cell paint. <laughs> Um, which is important from a logistical standpoint um, and has metabolic competency because um, it is a, a liver cell line. So we have both phase one and phase two enzyme. We're going to run a smaller subset um, on cell painting in a rat platform. What that platform is, is still uh, to be determined. Um, and then also looking at organoids or organ on the chip. Um, for transcriptomics, we're going to, again, um, have a subset on that for both the, the HEPRG and then whatever the selected RAP platform is. And then finally, for proteomics, um, just exclusively focusing on the HEPRG cell line. Um, any questions or before we move on to the next work stream? Yeah, I think I'll, I just wanted to add one thing, which is, you know, this is our initial study design. And so as we work through assay development um, and also hopefully bring, you know, new court new partners on board. And so we're, we're working through the numbers. So I just want to make sure everyone knows this isn't our final plan. But, you know, going through and deciding on subsets of compounds was 
you know, a decision based off of feasibility um, and resources, but could be expanded. Um, and then those decisions about what compounds that will, those will be in those smaller subsets will be made through this work stream at a later point once we have the data um, from the U2S and HEPA RG and we can kind of make an informed decision about what would be interesting, you know, what's our smaller subset of interesting compounds. If I, if I could add just one other thing, I think Justin, you set it up well. I think too, like a lot of this thought was our, what are our scientific questions? So for this, a lot of this is if we look across cell painting, going through all the different models, we can look at the complexity of the model. How does it respond with cell painting? What information do we get from it? And then the thought with the HEPA-RIG is, is we can compare across omics to see what information we get with each um, type of technology in the same model. Thanks, Connie. There, there are a couple questions in the chat. I don't know if you're able to see, Chrissy. I can read them if not. I am not. Can you? Um... Yeah, sure. Um, so Emmanuel asked, will HEPA RGs be 2D only? Or are we considering spheroids? Um, so this big um, full compound data set with cell painting and HEPA RG, that's in the 2D um, format. Um, you know, we could consider um, a subset, like in that organoid, um, you know, we could consider that with with the HEPRG, but it's still to be determined what that platform is going to be. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't scroll down far enough, Jess. I saw you answered that just later. That's okay. Yep. On, um, I was emailing with with Steve Ferguson, and his lab is doing some of the 3D models. Is that right, Steve? So maybe that's some info we could share with the group and some learnings. Yes, that is correct. Um, and, and just to be clear, you know, the imaging is much more difficult in 3D, but you can get the lower hemisphere with, uh, you know, some of the, the more advanced uh, confocal systems, but we have not sorted out that in any way to the degree that Josh and others have been doing cell painting. So um, it would take some work to get to, to that point, but I do think there are some advantages to the system because the 2D systems would typically reflect more of a zone two of hepatic metabolism, whereas the spheroids can get a little bit closer to a, a mixed, uh, you know, combination that's closer to zone 2.5. So you get about a probably a five to tenfold increase in metabolic proficiency that for some chemicals could be a really important factor. Yeah, and that's where I see this being a really nice community of practice. You know, we kind of have what we can do with our resources and we can't go in 10 million directions to start. But if we get the learnings from people like Steve and others looking into this, that can definitely feed into other tiers and is really important to share. Um, okay, question from Joe. For the question, the chemical is not tested in each assay or model. Will the compounds be selected prospectively based on literature or at a later time? So part of that, Joe, I think it's kind of twofold. Some of it, um, as you see the smaller X's and we try to write a little bit, like for U2OS and cell painting, given the kind of cost of the model being lower and just our ability to run with it, we're gonna run all the Dilly list compounds, which don't necessarily have the in vivo rat data with it. So we can run a larger data set there. But then our thought for some of it, like the HEPA-RG for transcriptomics, given you know the higher cost of the platform and just the ability to link to the existing data, we were thinking they're having the in vivo only data. But I think this will be tiered too, and we can have lessons learned from each step. Yeah, and I, I agree um, with what Connie's saying. So we'll need to you know carefully select um, the subsets for transcriptomics and proteomics. You know they're more expensive, and you know what we want to use for at the end of the day is taking these points of departure from these different omics technologies for um, in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. And in order to do that well, you know, from we need you know really good in vivo data to benchmark that too. Um, and I, I mentioned there's a you know variety of the type of in vivo data that's a, that we can extract from these databases. You know, the donated compounds, for example, they should have very comprehensive 28-day you know, rat studies with a dose response and histopathology, et cetera. Um, it's going to be obviously a lot more difficult to do IVAVE if you have uh, from a publicly available data set only like one or two dose levels. Um, you know, we might not have that comprehensive in vivo data that we're really looking for. So that's how we're going to start, I think, triaging um, molecules for those for the transcriptomics and proteomics. Mm -hmm. I think that also kind of answers sort of another question that came up on histopath. So um, 
so Rick, where is the question of are we going to extract histopath from the existing in vivo data if available? Yes, we're going to be using histopathology, um, but I don't think we're going to be planning to conduct additional histopathology. We're not planning to do animal right. studies, so it's leveraging what, yeah. what's existing. Yeah. No, I was asking about yeah. histopath and some of the uh, cell studies themselves. It's sometimes that confirmatory histopath is helpful. Um, no, that's that's not planned. Um, we're focusing on the the three platforms listed here, so painting, omics, and proteomics. Okay, Anne had a comment on that. I think we it was answered on the transcriptomics platform. Sorry, I'm going through the own chat. Um, the overlap of Oasis and, and Jump, I think that's a good question. I don't know that we've necessarily looked, but now as we're getting a list, maybe that's something we could now take a look on what was in Jump and what was there to see what we could maybe leverage from there and expected results. And I don't know if you've taken a look or thought about that. No, it's funny you asked that because Sridget and I were just um, texting back and forth and he's he's calculating <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, I was We're talking about that, but I'm calculating that, yeah, because they're, they're mostly approved drugs, so it should be that there would be a good overlap, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sorry, I'll just, ahead, I'll just note that um, since I've made these slides, the um, Sridget has compiled the comprehensive list um, of compounds from these um, in vivo data sources. And so that will be sent out to members, like hopefully by this afternoon. Um, so you all can look at the list and see if there's any, you know, anything that is of interest to you and we can kind of try to prioritize where you know where we want to move forward with those compounds okay there there's questions about additional daily readouts such as albumin urea and other biomarkers we hadn't initially planned i think we really need to be thoughtful about like what we can complex together versus what needs its own run to do and what's possible but it hasn't come up yet um I don't know if does someone have something to say to that point. Um, I have worked on something similar to to predict some proxy assay readouts and then predict delays from that. Predicted labels work quite well, so if there is available data on this, we can train separate models and predict for the for the for the OSS compounds um, and and use real data where available. So we don't necessarily need to run all proxy assays directly in our consortium. I think we can use available data, and if there are members who are, who are willing to share data, then we can train models and not release the data, but we can use those predicted labels at least. Yeah, I guess it's kind of twofold. There might be like albumin and ALTAST from the animal studies, but I, th I think this question, maybe maybe you meant this too as well, Shredded, and I just misunderstood, um, from like the actual cell exposures. Um, I, I do I do know that um, there, there was another hand up. Steve, did you have a reply to that specifically though? Uh, no, well, my comment was more on um... The albumin itself is actually showing up in, 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 in microphysiological system circles to to really be an early indicator of drug induced liver injury. So you know it it can be easily just just removing spent culture media and transferring it over. Same for LDH leakage. Uh, th these would be really uh, useful complements. I think in particular the LDH um, you know would be a nice confirmation of cell cell death. You know dying cells. But um, they wouldn't cost any more. You could just, you know, transfer them over and freeze them, and then go back and analyze them later. So um, it would be a value add. Yeah, that's a good point to at least save it for the time being, and then maybe between partners, see if we can can resource it. Um, Jamie, I don't know. Is that something you, your the court routinely does for service, or is that something we need to look into? Oh, we don't do it in house. We can mm -hmm. definitely do the transfer and saving. We just have to add it into the budget, but it's doable. Um, we okay. have to figure out where to save all the plates though, so. Okay, no, that's really helpful. Um, Bruce, I, I guess you put your question in the chat. Sorry, I did see your hand up, but will the in vivo data include transcriptomics uh, profiling data? You know, I like for TG Gates and Drug Matrix, it exists and we've done work and other projects to analyze it. So I think as we could, compile it together and think how to use it. It's something we might want to compare. You know, we could have both the apical point of departure or low, low EL, et cetera, and that. Um, it'd be worth thinking if we could get that for every compound, if it has it, and then how to use it maybe on the comparison side. David, have you thought about that? 
Non, non, definitively, that will be part of the integrative analysis, hein, the work package on the integrative analysis. I think it's uh, everything that's going to be available uh, needs to be put into perspective. And indeed, the TGGate uh, data set is super interesting uh, in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think especially for molecules like from the TG Gates data set that that B pod I think should be extracted and we can use that for IV IVE as, as one of the exercises. There are there are still more questions and comments. But I think they're very useful and it's it's good to hear from folks. Um, Terry asked, how balanced is the library between talks and non talks? I don't have a, a great answer on that. I don't know, Jess or David, you would like to start. So yeah, yeah, for oh uh, go ahead, David. No, no, please, please, please. Yes. Uh, please. I was gonna is if non-tox is talking about just available like human data like the the Dillist or Dilly rank, um, we have more in that list compared to where we have the in vivo rat data so far. Um, if that's what that was if that's what the question was gearing at. Um, go ahead, David, if you want to add your thoughts. Uh, I just, uh, I was about to say, uh, it's, it's the same, it's, it's just about the definition of what we, what we call, it's a negative control, basically. So it's something, it's a compound when given to either human or, uh, or rat, doesn't induce any kind of effect uh, in the liver. So that would be an essential piece for the control, as a control for the, for the experiment and to, um, to assess the, uh, the validity of the signature that's going to be generated uh, in uh, in uh, in the project. Yeah. The negative control always always good. Yeah, and I and I think and one way to look at that too is that for you know toxic to liver compounds, you know, particularly looking at the in vivo rat, there's going to be a very wide range on what that point of departure is and what that you know that potency. Um, we need to have a, a nice wide range of that, and I think I think we will get that, but we don't have the answer to that um, yet, because a POD of you know, you know, 0.5 milligram per kilogram per day is very different from 500. Those should not be in the same category. Yeah. Good questions and thoughts. See other few other comments, but I think that was all the questions. If I missed one, someone raise hand real quick. I think that's it for the time being. What's the proteomics platform? Yeah, it isn't ELISA based. Um, Chrissy, do we have a slide on that later on about proteomics? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's um? Oh, I saw one other pop. Yeah. Let's move on to our study design work stream, and we can continue the the questions through there. Um. So I will hand it over to Josh Harrell. Hey everybody, hear me okay? Thumbs yes. up. Cool. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for passing it over, Chrissy. Um, this is great because we've already talked about a lot of the questions that are going to be on these next couple slides uh, regarding the study design work stream. So um, really the purpose of the study design group is to develop the study design for the cell painting, transcriptomics, and proteomics experiments, working with the, the technology providers or the folks who will actually be doing the screenings in their laboratories. Um, some of the key objectives and challenges that we want to address um, are determine what cell types to use. We've already talked about that a bit on the previous slide and, and kicking around some other ideas. Uh, what exposure concentrations to use and how many, what time points, how many replicates, kind of the, the nitty gritty of uh, chemical screening study design uh, that's appropriate for use to each one of these platforms. Um, this group is also charged with assay development, uh, troubleshooting the application of the assays to new cell lines and new systems. Certainly the, the liver organoids or 3D hep RG or other things would qualify as kind of new territory for some of these technologies. And then uh, as Joe was uh, alluding to, selecting criteria, setting criteria for selecting which compounds to test and which assays as we kind of walk through that uh, flow chart that was on the previous slide, uh, kind of the step down how many chemicals we're gonna test in each system. So far, uh, the study design work stream has been fairly busy, uh, thanks to a lot of work from Jamie Che on uh, developing the cell printing protocol that's been uh, revised a few times now, um, drafted and reviewed for actually running the cell painting assay in UTOS and HEPRG cells. Um, and we've also worked on some details regarding the culturing of those and how to deliver test chemicals and, and what the restrictions are on library prep and things like that for chemical screening. So that protocol is pretty far down the road at this point. Uh, assay development, there'll be a few troubleshooting experiments or pilot experiments that we anticipate will be conducted before we actually jump into the, the screening of any kind of large chemical sets. 
Uh, I think the plan, unless I'm mistaken, is to start a lot of that in the UTLS model and then work our way to more complex systems. Um, for transcriptomics, um, we have verbal agreement from BioSpider to use their TempoSeq S1500 plus surrogate platform. Uh, that platform is available for both human and rat. Uh, covers right around 2300 genes, I believe, in each species, and is, is meant to be a, a surrogate transcriptome that will give you the equivalent of whole transcriptome coverage. Uh, has a pretty good track record, track record of uh, point of departure determination at this point. Uh, so we're... Um, there's a BioSpider technology presentation in November. I would encourage folks to uh, who have the invite to that to attend and hear more about that technology. And then for proteomics, we have a verbal agreement with Nomic Bio to use what's called their Analyza platform on a subset of the HEPA RG cells. And there'll be a Nomic Bio technology presentation scheduled for October. Um, well, they'll be able to answer your questions about what the technology actually is, how does it work, what can they measure, uh, et cetera. Um, but I think that might be just the pair of slides we have there before we get yeah. into the legal stuff. Yeah, yeah thanks, Josh. Um, so I know we have BioSpider and Nomic Bio on the line, and I appreciate you all being here. Um, so at this point, if there are any questions from the group um, along study design, I only have a few more updates uh, before we close out the meeting, so I can take a few more questions if there are any. There, there was a question on um, the time course for cell painting, 48 versus 24. Jamie, did we decide on 24? Is that for the U2OS or is that something we're still? I thinking? believe both the U2OSs and HEPA RGs are currently written at 24 hours, but that obviously can be moved if there is a strong argument to do 48. 48 is what we've always done. We, we usually get stronger signals at 48 versus 24 for the one small experiment where we actually compared the two. So I would I would definitely pick 48 instead of 24 unless there was a compelling reason not to. And maybe there is such for, I, I don't know, I've obviously never worked with the HEPA RGs or anything else. So I don't know if there is a good reason to switch to small, a shorter time point. I guess the, the, one of the main things to consider there is what we want to anchor back to. If it's the cell painting jump data sets or other data sets that are out there, it'd be advantageous to use the same exposure durations. Yeah. I think a lot of the previous work that's been done in HEPA RGs was at 24. So I think that's why we were starting there. But again, we can switch it to 48. That's not a big deal for us either way. Maybe we could consider a, a small pilot experiment looking at, um, you know, a subset of compounds with really robust in vivo data and doing 24 versus 48, and that could refine everything else. Um, I saw Joe's hand up. Hello. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the 24 to 48 hours. So I have done a very small pilot study with about 15 compounds. Um, and I've also seen that the signal gets stronger at 48 hours, but we decided to move forward with 24 hours at EPA because we had the impression that more unspecific signal comes, like unspecific in the sense of um, we wanted to focus on finding the initiating mode of action of the chemicals and we thought that they might be better visible at the early time points versus the late time points so that was a factor um, to consider i cannot say for sure that it's better if you only use 24 hours but um, they they look slightly different thank you yep. um, i see steven has a comment as well that Let's see, experience been a repeated dose by 96 hours. Stephen, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Joe hit it really nicely. So if it turns out we, uh, you know, the focus is on that molecular initiating event, 24 hours is really great. If the focus is to try to distinguish daily and non-daily, what we have seen in 2D, 3D, you know, systems, primary cells, HEPRG is that, when you have a repeated dose exposure for a longer period of time, and we've settled on 96 hours with one repeated dose, so we feed every other day, 
that that gives us the best efficiency within one week of, of laboratory work to actually discriminate those those chemicals uh, you know so so that's where we've landed um, I think there are arguments to be made with transcriptomics that as you go and you start drifting you get mixed signals and so it really just boils down to what the primary goals of the transcriptomic data are thank you any other questions before we move on all right Great. Well, just with the few minutes we have left, I just wanted to provide um, an update on the legal work stream, which is kind of um, our internal work stream at HESI. Um, but for our industry members, we had an OASIS consortium agreement that was prepared and co-signed by both HESI and the Broad. It's been distributed to all 13 of our current partners. At this point, we have eight um, that have signed and the remainder of you we've talked and, and they are on their way shortly. So um, just keep me posted on that. And for our non-industry partners, we're putting together just a general guiding principles to make sure you know we're all on the same page and just um, that should be coming out um, shortly as well. And that'll just be no signature, but just a general, if you're participating, we all agree to these guidelines. We have a plan for at least three future work streams. This could change depending on you know, timing and, and what comes up. But Shantanu Singh will be leading our cell painting feature extraction work stream once that data has begun generating. Um, Andrea Spender will be leading our integrative data analysis work stream. And then at this point, we do not have a lead identified for our exposure modeling in QIV IVE work stream. So if that is something you are interested in or you know someone who um, has expertise in this area, please let us know. And finally, um, I just wanted to note a few deliverables that we've come across at this point. Um, so on behalf of the OASIS Consortium, HESI has presented a poster at the Environmental Mutagenesis and Genomics Society, and we also had a special interest group talk there. And we are preparing abstracts for um, at least two upcoming conferences. There may be more, um, but just wanted to let you know that um, we're starting to get our word, our name out there. If um, you see us at conferences, please come say hi. And if you have anything, you know, if a conference comes across your desk that you think would be a great opportunity for Oasis, please let me know. And we've already started to think about some publication ideas. This is very, very early in, in discussion, but just wanted to let you know that um, we have some things on the table. One could be a potential expert review in which you know, we detail kind of the limitations that there are right now, explain the value of these systems approaches and basically use it as a paper to announce the OASIS Consortium. And then another idea that was presented from a member was that we could, you know, Srijit and others have done so much work pulling together these liver toxicants that maybe there's a way that we could package that into a nice paper as well. So again, just letting you know we're, we're starting to think about how to get our name out there and we're open for ideas um, about how to distribute this information. And so with that, um, that's the end of the slides that I have prepared. We are still recruiting additional partners. So if you on the call or if you know um, colleagues that you think would be interested, please let Connie or I know we're happy to set up individual meetings to talk about the different membership tiers and also just how you can be involved. We're interested in all parties, um, but specifically we could use some extra help with proteomics in QIVIVE. So if that is you and you are interested in getting more involved, please let us know. <laughs>